My next guest joins me from Middlesbrough, England. He is Tapology 6 ranked featherweight in the United Kingdom, and you can catch him in action next at Cage Warriors 140 on 25 June, where he will be taking on the Italian Federico Pasquale. Of course, I'm talking about Harry Houdini Hardwick. Mr. Hardwick, thank you so much for being here, man. Uh, absolute honor to get this opportunity to talk to you. How are you doing on uh, what the Queen's Jubilee? We were talking about this before we recorded. I still don't really know what that means, but it sounds like you don't either, and we're a good company. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks for having me on, man. Um, yeah, I think she, she, she's been in power a long time. People put Some people have put bunting up. Um, my neighbors across the street were drinking from like one in the afternoon till about midnight yesterday. Um, found out one of them was a police officer who arrested Lee Murray back in the day, which is, you know, very strange. Very strange indeed. And what's interesting is you and your brother, you both have very important bouts upcoming. Of course, you fight at the end of June and then at the end of July. George fights. I wanted to get your opinion on how training camp has been going for both of you. I know that you put, probably put in a lot of work together, getting each other prepared for these bouts. With uh, him fighting Driscoll, you fighting Pasquale, these are two opponents that are very, very difficult, very, very tough. Victories over both of these gents would really propel both of your careers and kind of get you in that next level sort of discussion. Can you talk to me about how your camp has been going and your thoughts on uh, George's opponent. Yeah, so camp's been good. Um, feeling like I'm sort of peaking appropriately. Uh, you know, like getting to the point now where I'm sort of feeling like noticeably better, more sessions, feel like I'm like accelerating. Um, feel like like the intensity is picking up, but the amount of rounds I'm doing is 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 dropping, if you get me. Mm -hmm. So it's like out of camp, I probably end up doing more training and more rounds, whereas like towards fight time, um, the intensity picks up and it's like, it's more about like going hard and like redlining yourself in your rounds and stuff. But yeah, feeling very good. Train training's hard. It's it's like, it, it is tough. Like last night, my body just didn't want to start doing anything before wrestling started. And then I was just, all right, I just got to just do what I can do, what I can do. And then like, you know, got through the rounds and it was good. But um, yeah, feel it, feeling fantastic, feeling ready to, uh, ready to go, feeling ready to test Pasquale because he's, he's never been tested really. Mm -hmm. um, like the one good opponent he's fought is Paul McBain. And Paul McBain got knocked out um, holding pads for one of his PTs the week before that fight happened. So like that's why his chin was a bit, a bit shaky. So I'm, I'm going to test him like, you know, me me and Pasquale have went, like, total opposite routes as far as our careers go. Pasquale's had a lot of, like, easier fights on home shows. He's, had, he's got a bit of a padded record, whereas I've been the opposite. I've had, like, hard fight after hard fight after hard fight. I've been the blue corner in so many fights. I've been the the away side. Um, and I'm just going to I'm just gonna show him that his route was the wrong route. Um, it, it's very interesting that you mentioned that. Um, I did key up on that as well. He does have an undefeated record, but I don't think there's really any comparison between the level of competition that he's had abroad in Italy versus the level of competition in the UK. They're very, very different. I certainly don't mean any uh, shade to my Italian friends out there, but facts are facts. Um, you, when you look at your resume and you look at the victories that you have been able to earn over some of the top level competition in the UK, I think that gives you a big advantage going into this one. And as far as George is concerned, what are your thoughts on uh, his bout against uh, Kyle Driscoll? Yeah, so Driscoll's, it, it's it's going to be fun um, fighting someone for, from AKA. It's like we're, we're a little gym in Middlesbrough with, with two, pro, um, two pro fighters and both of them are called Hardwick. But uh, <laughs> yeah, like, do you know what? Like every commentators in all of Driscoll's fights talk about his wrestling and talk about his wrestling. Oh, he's, he's this, this, this like amateur wrestler and all this kind of, okay. am I allowed to swear? Yeah, absolutely. And all this shite. Um, but then, uh, like I'm, I'm not blown away by his wrestling at all. I, it's, it's not that impressive. Like obviously we're very fortunate in our gym to have been taught wrestling by Abdul Muhammad. I'm not sure if you're as aware of him. Um, Afghan, Afghan guy, great wrestler was like a pioneer in um, 
UK MMA, like just really like top class wrestler. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not blown away by Driscoll's wrestling at all. Um, I think he, I don't know what the actor's name is, but he looks like the guy from Resident Alien. <laughs> oh, poor Kyle Driscoll. <laughs> hey, we'll take that as a compliment, though. We're going to take it as a compliment. If you have a resemblance to somebody in Hollywood, how is that a bad thing? Uh, maybe people mix you up. Maybe the paychecks get mixed up. Who knows? I mean, Hollywood paychecks is certainly better than MMA paychecks. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Harry, one of the things that I find is so intriguing about your career is you have been a professional for a number of years and you've really paid your dues as the years have unfolded. We've already hit on the level of competition that you've had. And one of the things I mentioned to you previously was at Bellator Euro Series 8, that was the last loss that you've had. That was some time ago, a couple of years ago against Richie Smullen. That version of you compared to the version I've been seeing lately, they seem like two different fighters, but I know it wasn't really all that long ago. Can you talk to me a little bit about when you go back and look at that fight here almost two years later, are there things about your game that you've really worked on without giving too much away? Uh, Cause I certainly don't want to do that. Well, I think f- first and foremost, I think the, the, the biggest, most drastic thing was I actually got a strength and conditioning coach, um, unit 29 fitness, um, Andy Coulson, like fantastic strength and conditioning coach is, um, was mentored by Phil Daru. Do you know the, guy used to be, to be ATT and do a lot of the ATT guy stuff. But like before that, I was just some like skinny noodle. I didn't cut weight for featherweight. I was even skinny when I was at Bantamweight. Um, and I had no like muscle or like physicality about me. I, I just had good endurance. And I think the good endurance was literally just because of how skinny I was. Um, yeah. So the, the, there's that, that big physical change is that a, is that a huge, huge um, boost on my, you know, my, my fighting ability, um, just like actually having a bit of weight to cut, like the, for the small and fight, I probably walked into the cage less like about 150 pounds, something like that, mm-hmm. like not much at all. Um, and, and I kind of got squeezed on. And then like, I feel like if I had a bit more weight behind me, those shots that I was landing in the third round wouldn't have just stumbled him. They'd have, they'd have dropped him. Um, and then the other thing was just like, I was too sort of, happy beforehand just fighting very I was like my career before that I was like just fighting very infrequently um, and I was just always the blue corner and always like I was just sort of like meandering I didn't have any like management or it was like MMA is not as established in Middlesbrough so like there wasn't really a path or a route so it was like you know 2020 I'd been a pro since 2015 and I had a, a five and three record at the end of 2020, which just sucked. And I was like, I know it sounds stupid because I was only 26, but I was like, fucking hell, I'm, I'm running out of time. I think I've, I think I've like fucked my career here. Like ge- mm-hmm. genuinely, I thought I, I'd, um, my, I, I'd, my career was like unsalvageable almost. And I was like, I, I was really down about it for a while. Um, and then obviously there was lockdowns and then there was just no fight shows going on and I couldn't, I couldn't find anything. Um, any, I couldn't find any like fights and it was just, yeah, I just didn't know where I was going to go. And then I got the fight in Croatia in April last year. Like that was really short notice, but I got, that got put together. Um, literally cause, um, someone I know, who does like matchmaking for shows put a post on Facebook that they were looking for a featherweight against an eight and two opponent, um, Europe only or something. And I was like, yeah, sound. Um, and then they were like, yeah, that fight, I pretty much like, it would maybe not like actually literally saved my career, but in my head it did. Um, and it was just with the added strength and conditioning with like the added focus on like, just to not, not allowing someone to be able to squeeze on me and just changes in my technique and taking training a lot more seriously. Um, like that fight was a style that I'd struggled with in the past. It was, I'd never flown home the winner of my own fight, uh, but I'd never won a short notice fight up to that point. So that was all three of those things. And it was the most confident I've ever been going into a fight. And then off that, I just kept the ball rolling. Um, and then obviously, the, the, Signing with Cage Warriors because the the thing with Cage Warriors is that they'll keep 
you know, if you want to be active, they'll keep you active. Like there's always shows going on with Cage Warriors. Um, with, with Bellator, you you never know. Like literally, you even when Bellator's going through more of an active spell, you just don't know when your next fight's going to be. But with Cage Warriors, it's like you will get fights. They crank them out. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ian, Ian Dean is fucking good at his job. The matchmaker for Cage Warriors, like. I think if you were to talk about the most influential figure in UK MMA ever, it's Ian Dean. Like, there's no if, ands, maybe, or buts. It's Ian Dean. Like, it's not a fighter. It's not this. It's not that. Ian Dean, the Cage Warriors matchmaker, is the the most important figure in, that UK MMA has had. Um, one he's of, fucking good. Sorry, I was just saying, good at his job. One of the things that I think is just, uh, well, I want to get your perspective on this, Harry, and it's, you're at a point in your career, you're in your athletic prime as you're, you know, as you transition over into like your late twenties, early thirties, that sort of time frame. One of the questions I've always had, and I don't know if it's a myth or not. So I'd really, I'd, I'd be keen to get your perspective is, is there such a thing as aging out of a window to get promoted into one of these like big uh, uh, promotions, such as like UFC, Bellator, et cetera. Is that such a thing or do people look way too much into that? I think people do look a bit too much into it. Um, I just think, like, I, I ideally like to be beyond Cage Warriors um, by, like, when I'm 28. Mm-hmm. So, I'm, uh, you know, like, I, I turned 28 in, at the end of September, so it's, I've still got plenty of time. Absolutely. Um, it's just... You've got a bit more. You're in a bit more of a rush when you get there to to establish yourself. But saying that, Francisco Trinaldo didn't get into the UFC till he was 34, mm-hmm. and he's not he's not in like heavier weight classes or anything. Like he's, I think, you know, if, as long as you're looking after yourself properly, you've got tons and tons of time as a fighter. I think the uh, one of the understated things about it is people are in such a rush to get there. They find they're they're in there at 24, 25 years old. Now you have to stay there. Good luck because you're going, you're at such a young age. You're not even your athletic prime and you're going to fight some 31 year old guy who definitely is in his prime. And you see these like young prospects wash out. And I'm sure that's something that you've seen time and time again in your fighting career. Yeah. The, the revolving door of the UFC kind of, um, it's like you, you need to get there. You need to either get there when you're ready so you don't get like churned up in the revolving door or just do a Holloway and a, or a, an Oliveira and just get there super, super early. I just have loads of really tough fights and take losses and take this, that you just got to keep bouncing back from until eventually you, you, you know, you're good enough to stay. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard. It's, it, it, it's a tough career path to choose. Um, I was, um, you know, kind of disappointed because, uh, you know, uh, Reese McKee is a great example. I know he's headlining your card. Um, he, he, he comes into the UFC, only two fights. And, and I know he's a young guy, but of course he fights Ham- Hamzat and then he fights Alex Morona, who's been in this game for a very, very long time. I'm quite a fan of Reese McKee. I think he's a fantastic fighter. I don't, he's not even in his prime yet. He's got loads of potential and for him to get bounced after just two fights now he's got to like reprove his worth and like scratch and claw to get back and i thought that was a really good case study of a young uh european prospect who um got didn't really get i think a fair shake i don't i don't believe yeah and he was maybe a bit too eager to sort of like to jump in short notice against Kamzat, like, oh, yeah, you, you, you're in the UFC, but, but it's... It, you can't just be, like, giving up all those advantages and, and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, given, given, the, the, given the style of, of the opponent, like, you know that that guy's a, uh, an amazing grappler. It's like, eh. Maybe you're better off holding out and waiting for somebody who's a little more stylistically suitable for you. Yeah, it's there's lots of like different things about like timing and career opportunities and um and all that stuff. But yeah, it was it was unfortunate for Reese McKee. Um I mean 
he's, it's, it would be a cracker of a fight against Burlington. Like Burlington's my friend. I've trained with Burlington recently. Um, I, I, I do feel Burlington will, will definitely win. Um, mm -hmm. Like, but Reese McKee's dangerous enough where like, I, you know, like if Burlington has a lapse, Reese McKee can crack him. So Burlington, I mean, to be fair, but I was going to say Burlington needs to be on form. When I sparred him the other week, he, he was on form. Like, mm -hmm. fucking hell. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's a, it's going to be a cracker of a fight. The entire card is uh, very, very good. I'm really looking forward to it. Of course, you fight later on. Um, I believe you're not the co-main. You're the one right prior to the co-main. So uh, unless I'm mistaken, do you know? I didn't even know that. Oh, okay. Well, um, that's what I'm looking at right now. It looks like you are uh, right uh, prior, the bout prior to the co-main. Of course, these, uh, I highly doubt all of these bouts are actually going to occur. Somebody's going to miss the weight. Somebody's going to get sick and pull out. we got a long time to go yet. I hope that doesn't happen with your bout, though. Of course, let's knock on wood. I want to um, really quickly get your take. For somebody who's been as active as you have, fought in various promotions throughout Europe. You did. You only recently, it seems like you've been in Cage Warriors forever, but you haven't. This is uh, only going to be your, what, third bout in um, yeah. the Cage Warriors promotion, which is crazy because you're just one of those guys I look at and you're like, oh yeah, he's been there forever. And it's like, oh, wait a minute. No, he hasn't. Um, you're just a name I've heard about for quite some time. Can you talk a little bit when you were about to make your Cage Warriors debut at 124 against Endoy? What was kind of going through your mind? I know you've been in uh, big promotions before. I know you fought in Bellator previously um, and smaller shows throughout England and, and, and Europe at large. But was there an added sense of like nerves or were you a little bit more? Um, did you have to like prepare for that bout in a, in a different manner from your previous ones? Because Cage Warriors... Like when I think of mixed martial arts in the UK, like I immediately think of cage warriors. That's the very first thing I think about. Was there like an added sense of urgency? Did you feel a lot of pressure going into that bout um, that you kind of needed to prove like, no, this is the promotion I belong in, the premier organization for mixed martial arts in England? And, uh, like, and, and we didn't even sign a multi-fight one straight away. It was just a, a like a one fight deal. Um, that my Cage Warriors debut was actually going to be like exactly a year before my next fight. Like mm -hmm. they're exactly a year apart, which is, which is nice. Um, well, no, like it's, you just get to the point where it's, um, it's another just, fight. Yeah. Like it, Cage Warriors pr um, production people do a much better job of, of like any other promotion I've been to where they're like, they've got those like cage warriors and locked things. And it's like, you can sort of show your personality a bit more. And I think cause me and George have shown, a, it's not even like we've shown more personality or something. I think it's just, we don't do the usual boring platitudes when like a camera gets pointed in our face, like, Oh, I'm, I'm so ready for my fight. You know, I'm a, a different animal. I've been, I've been training hard. I'm really ready. I'm stoked. The weight cut, you know, it's tough, but it's gotta be done. Like, you know, when you just see every single person doing the exact same shit. In there and it's, I have to say, that's actually a really good American accent. That's really good. <laughs> I, well, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm a man of many talents. <laughs> I think you I could uh, get on the phone and just pretend like you're one of us because I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. That's that's. I mean, I can do the rest of the interview in American accent if you want. Um, <laughs> like... I don't know what this one is. This more like California, where you get the rising inflection on the end of what you're saying. I think it's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. We'll go with that. I spent quite a bit of time in California. One of the things about the uh, bout I love so much uh, against Endoy is I like the fact that you got clipped. I like the fact that he sat you down. And I like the fact that you had to bounce back from adversity and you did that. And then you completely took over the, the rest of the bout. Your body work was absolutely beautiful. I love watching your striking. You have a very, very fan friendly style of fighting. Like I, your fights do not bore me. Um, and you're very well-rounded. Your clinch work is amazing. Dirty boxing is amazing. And, and to be frank, there are a lot of, uh, there are, a point, there was a point in time where 
I thought you were going to knock out Ngoy. I thought he was done. And the fact that he survived the entire 15 minutes was absolutely astonishing to me. I, I, I thought he was going to uh, fold like a lawn chair after you got some of those kidney shots on him. Yeah, he was, he was tough. Like, he, like I, I, I personally think I fought the best Ndoy that's ever rocked up to any fight. Yeah, he, he was tough. Like, and then being dropped, that was like the first time that had ever happened. I remember like not a hundred percent being sure if I'd been dropped because obviously I, I didn't like I just remember sort of stepping in to throw a right hand, and then I was facing the other way, and I could kind of remember standing back up, but like I couldn't. Like it, you know, you just sort of lose that time. Like you lose those couple of seconds, so it's just like, eh. um. But yeah, he was, he was tough, man. Um. Like I'd spread the damage across different points. I'd managed to hurt him to the head a few times, but he just kept in there. And he kept his power as well. Like obviously it wasn't as, as big as the first round, but like he still hit hard. Like even even later on, like his kicks were, were sort of like they were awkward to catch and like they were hitting my arms. I was like, fucking hell, that hurts. Um but yeah. So I've had like two really tricky, harder opponents in my cage warriors fights, like the deck was a tough guy as well. And like, I was, I was a bit ill before the death fight. It's like, I, I look physically a lot worse and like spongier for that fight. Um, and then he, he kicks me in the rib and knocks my intercostals in the first round. And then I have to spend the whole fight in agony. So, <laughs> so that's the thing. Everyone wants to like kick you in the balls as hard as they can for every one of your fights so far. Why is that? <laughs> um, are you saying, are you like sending them like offensive memes before your fights or something like that? Because holy crap, like these aren't light, man. These aren't acts. They're, well, I'll give these guys the benefit of the doubt. I'm not saying that they would intentionally do that. But when you take a shot like that in that part of your body, you're not the same the rest of the fight. Like a hundred percent. You're compromised. Doy did it after, after dropping me. So like he chins me and then just wallops me in the balls. I'm like, what's the point in that, man? <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I don't know if it's because I switched stance a lot. The the death ones were really bad, like just repeatedly front kicking me. And I don't know, man. Pete, Pete, one of my coaches, jokes that he sends out like twenty quid a ball, like t- tells my opponents, so "I'll give you twenty quid each ball shot you get on him." Um, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if it's going to be gangly and I switch stance. I don't know, dude. It's, I'm sitting on my couch and I'm seeing you take those shots, and I'm just like, I'm glad I'm not him because holy crap, make sure you, uh, you know, have your kids earlier on in life, man, because you take up more of those. That might not be a possibility for you. I'm just saying. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, I don't, uh, a little bit of unhelpful, uh, smart ass advice. I'm always good for that. When we talk <laughs> about Pasquale, you're talking, you, you hit on some things. We talked about him earlier, but I wanted kind of, uh, elaborate on this one a little bit before I let you go. Seven and zero fighter. His record, nah, it is padded. I do agree with you there on that front. But nonetheless, it is an important fight. Despite his record, despite him being undefeated, I, I, I mentioned earlier before in, in in a social media post I put you in that this is a very big fight for you. Arguably, he's the most. Uh, this is the most difficult fight of your career. But then the more and more I look at it, I don't know if I agree with myself. I'd almost kind of disagree with myself because personally for me, I think the fact that uh, I think the Endoy fight was probably the most difficult one. Um, in my opinion, when I look back on it again, and if I had to bet between Endoy and Pasquale fighting, my money would be in on Endoy. I know that's MMA math. I know that that doesn't necessarily mean shit. But when you think about Pasquale, are there any things about him um, talent-wise that you think he does exceptionally well and something that you're kind of mindful of? So he seems to have adopted the Michael Chandler-style defense. To, um, sorry, perhaps. To um, calf kicks, which there's ways around work. There's workarounds on that. Um his straight hitting looks improved. He used to be a bit wilder, um, but almost like he looks a bit less dangerous as a result of his straight hitting improving. But I feel like when he gets tired and when he gets beat up, the sort of wild, you know, the, the wild man's going to come out again. Um, he is apparently a black belt. Um, 
for because he doesn't have social media, but I, I stalked his coach. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he, he's a he's a black belt. Um, means fuck all. Uh, like he seems to, when he's on top, just grapple correctly. Like there's nothing, there's nothing that like really jumps off the page about it. You know, like yeah. when you see some people's talk. Like I know it's it's a bit cliched, but like Khabib or Makachev, where they've got this very um, like they've got these really good this really good squeeze with it. Do you know, what? I'm not going to give those guys credit. When you see Jack Shaw. Mm-hmm. And you see Jack Shaw on top of someone and he's got this really good squeeze with his leg and it's like he's constantly putting people out of the frying pan into the fire that kind of thing um, whereas Pasquale doesn't seem to have that he just seems to just just grapple correctly like it's not it's nothing special and then on his back um, I haven't seen a whole lot of it but he seems to like to go for leg locks to create Kazushi as Mr. Danaher would say Um <laughs> But again, against the level of competition he's fought, you could do whatever you want. You could stand up against those people. Um, one, one of the things that I find very interesting about him looking at his fight history, he has not been through the full 15 minutes since 2018. That's been a minute. Um, he's been reliant upon getting finishes against, mm, uh, this sounds kind of mean, but it's true lesser opponents he's been able to finish oh. them i say that with the exception of mcbain i do believe mcbain is a good fighter um so McBain, with all due no. mcbain aside like look slow that fight and you know got knocked out holding pads for someone like he was yeah. holding he said he was holding um pads for someone missed and got a shin to the head a week before the fight so his his chin will have been a bit iffy and do you know what pasquale like he did fight a guy a foot shorter than him with tits. That was quite funny. <laughs> hey, you know what? Uh, that shorter guy with tits, that sounds like a, a fighter I would create on UFC 4 because I do make some characters on there. And if you've seen a guy on UFC 4 when you're playing online that just looks sus or um, alarms you, it's probably one of my monstrosities that I put out there. Uh, Harry, you're an absolute legend, man. And I really appreciate your time. I want to give you the opportunity. I know that you have a lot of people and a lot of supporters. So if there's um, anyone that you would like to shout out, whether it be one of your sponsors or just some of your supporters, I'd like you to have that opportunity to do that before I let you go. Right. So I will try and get the sponsors out. If I forget anyone, sorry. (laughs) Yeah. uh, We'll we'll have to have you back and then you'll have to uh, do it again. So yeah, there's one right there. Rev gear. You know, Rev Gear, very, very good brand. Um, so there is JMAC Scaffolding, which is, you know, like literally me and George would not be able to sort of do what we do and focus on our trading with, without him and Lou McCarthy. Like Lou McCarthy, the guy who runs it, like, like genuinely, that guy, like we can't thank that guy enough. Um, there is, you know what? I'm going to struggle. Glenn with his marketing company, he's just brand brand new on the board. But there's Mobeen with Waste Clearance Services, the Jake Majid with Canopy North. There is Aaron Flanagan's with Work Financial. Uh, and then as far as gyms and stuff, I know I'll have forgotten a sponsor, but... Oh, actually, a new sponsor we got on board. Oh, Palmo let's go. in the post. Right, so the Palmo, have you heard of this yet? No. Right. So you're not... You, right. To be a fan of the Hardwick Brothers, you at least need to know what a Palmo is. Okay, enlighten me. Is T Side's dish? It's Middlesbrough's dish. It was created by an American soldier at the end of World War II who ended up living in T Side. What it is is it's somewhat similar to a chicken palm, but what it is is the the butterfly's chicken breast is breaded and then deep fried, not shallow fried in olive oil like some bitch. Deep fried, proper fat. Then there is a layer of like thick bechamel sauce and then cheddar on top and then it's grilled. Oh, well, not grilled. Or, um, what do you, broiled, mm-hmm. you call it? Yeah, yeah. Broiled and then melted. And then you tend to have this with like really garlicky garlic mayo. It is unbelievable. It is amazing food. That does um, sound quite good. It's fucking mint, mate. <laughs> well, you can only really get them in like... In Teesside, uh, if, you, if you get them anywhere else, they're not great. But Palmo's in the Post, which is connected to Central Park, a very well-established restaurant in Middlesbrough, do a service where to anywhere in the UK, you can order 
at Palm Oil and it will be sent to your house um, in like a vacuum bag that you can just cook for 20 minutes in the oven and then and then grill slash broil for a little bit. Um, and they like they, they last for five days. Great product. Anyone in the UK can have a Palm Oil due to Palm Oil's in the post. It's fantastic. And if you're not in the UK, so my, like me, you're fucked, I guess. Yeah. Well, for me, <laughs> so my, my, my girlfriend lives um, like 200 miles down south. So it's like, you know, it's a, it's a long distance and it's a bit of a trek. Sure. But I can have Palmos when I'm at her house because of Palmos in the post. Well, uh, that sounds absolutely fantastic. And for your inner glutton, make sure you check that out if you're in the UK. Um, the links for all of Harry's sponsors. Well, the ones that he sends me after we get done wrapping here, I'll include in the description of this video. Make sure you check that out. Harry, um, you're a true gent man. I wish you the best of luck on your upcoming bout. I'm very confident that you are going to do very well. I will go on to a suspect MMA gambling site so I can gamble on you because I, I, I know that you're good for it. Thank you for being here, my friend, and I hope we can do it again soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Right, I need to jump in the shower because I fucking stink. <laughs> <laughs>